with the next speaker, we've been really talking about um, science-y kind of tools. And we also really, really need social tools with what we're doing. And so I want to introduce uh, Lucy Myring. She and her husband, Danny, operate Myring Livestock Company. It's a fifth generation ranch in Colorado's North Park near Walden, Colorado. And so she, she's asked to speak at events like these because she has a, a really good grasp on succession planning for ranches. And I think that is something that we haven't talked about at Kivira, but that is a very important component of, of um, what we need to do managing going forward is, is take care of the succession planning so that there's not any of these huge surprises that, that knock us back on our heels. So please welcome Lucy. This is my first time to ever be at a Quivera conference, and I am just blown away with the speakers that you've had and the subjects. And Kate, my goodness, I've enjoyed this last topic. I can't even begin to tell you how much. And like Molly said, um, there's so much to living on the land, isn't there? There's things we've got to know about in caring for the land, but there's also things that we need to know to keep people on the land and to keep passing the land on from generation to generation. That's why I was asked to come here today. I'm very privileged to be here, and thank you for having me. The topic of my talk is going to be your death your estate plan could be the death of you yet. I hope that makes you smile a little bit because um, death is something that we don't like to think about and we generally kind of put on the back burner, but yet it's inevitable. Death is gonna occur to every one of us at some point in time and so we need to be aware of what we need to be doing on, the, on this subject. I want to tell you about my particular family and what we've ran into and give you a basic feel for my way of life and why I love the land and why I love ranching and why I want it to continue to be a viable way of life for the next generation. As Molly said, my husband is the fifth generation of his family to ranch in North Park. And you've got to understand North Park to understand the resilience of the people in North Park. We've heard of resilience here all morning long. Resilience of people, resilience of the environment. But North Park is unique. It is very special, very different, and I want to walk you guys through the generations of Myring Livestock Company, if I may. This picture that you see here in front of you is a picture of Danny's great, great, great grandparents. Their names were the Delaney's. The man on the wagon, his name was Dave. The small woman is his wife, Sophia. The little boy on the mule is their son, George. And the little girl, I'm going to try to point her out so you can see. See that little girl sitting on the ground there? That's their little daughter, Jeannie. And also, as long as we're pointing out things, can you make out those huge elk antlers on that wagon? Isn't that impressive? <laughs> but also their house in the background, a little log cabin, dirt floor, one room, that's what they lived in. When they came to North Park, they were one of three or four white families to even live in the area. This picture was taken in, 187, in the 1870s. And at the time, there were Utes and Arapaho that came into North Park in the summertime to hunt, but they had enough sense to get out before winter came, I'll guarantee you. And the settlers, the white settlers, started coming in. They thought that they could stay there year-round. They could ranch because God knows North Park is a God's cow country in the summertime. Knee-high grass, an abundance of water. 
They brought cattle in. They tried to keep them there. The first winter was a mild winter. They made it just fine. They thought, oh, this is, this is wonderful. But guess what? The next winter was a horrid winter. They lost cattle. Cattle were, they tried to drive the cattle out up into the Laramie Plains to get them up where they could, where the wind had swept the snow away and the cattle could, pardon me, survive on the grass. But it was very, very difficult. But that's when they knew that if they were going to ranch in North Park, they were going to have to grow a hay crop and feed hay. And so that's, and we'll talk about more of that as we go on through the story. This picture was taken in 1894, and the gentleman here, the third from the right, right here, is Danny's great-great-grandfather. His name was Ralph Coit Sr., and he married, remember the little girl that was on the previous picture setting on the ground? He married Jeannie, Jeannie Delaney. And they had several children, one of which is this small, this small boy sitting right here whose name was Fred. They also had a son named Joe who was my darling mother-in-law, Ruth Myring's father. So you see how this progression of the generations is taking place here. Ruth went to college and became a teacher, but she married Oliver Twist Myring. And all of you know the Oliver Twist story. Well, Twist became his nickname. His name was Oliver Rudolph Myring, but his name throughout his life was Twist. Everybody knew Twist Myring. But he came into North Park when he was a young man of 17. He um, came into the country with the clothes on his back and in a Model T Ford, and that was his entire possessions. He went to work for Henry Seymour and uh, Ruth's dad, Joe Coit, and eventually married Ruth. and. They had nothing to begin with. He worked for $40 a month, and life was tough. I mean, they started out, they didn't even own any furniture, but they weren't afraid of hard work, and they worked hard, and Twist got a haying contract with Henry Seymour and was able to put up the hay for 200 and something uh, dollars uh, a hay season, which was big, big money. But he had to irrigate the crop and put it up. And so it was a lot of work, but they were up to it. They were young, they were eager, they knew what life they wanted and they wanted to ranch. And so that was their beginnings. They were able to buy the Henry Seymour Ranch. They later bought back the Coit Ranch from the estate and added on a couple more ranches to it. And so that's the story of Myring Livestock Company. When I came there uh, 35 years ago, it was the largest family-owned mountain ranch in the state of Colorado. And I'm sharing this with you because they did that from nothing. I think that's impressive. Well, then Ruth and Twist had three sons. And Danny was their youngest, and this is him in this picture. He's my husband. And uh, so we, we are still running a portion of the ranch, the Henry Seymour portion. We're still running that, plus part of, the, of his granddad, uh, Joe Coit's ranch. So we have been able to maintain and keep up good portion of the ranch alive and well and running. This was Twist Homestead Cabin. He built it in 1931. It's in an aspen grove. It's a beautiful, beautiful spot. And, you know, very similar to the cabin you saw in the first picture. Log cabin, dirt floor. But that was his homestead cabin. This is the house that Danny and I live in today, and uh, it's, it's quite a bit 
it's quite a bit nicer than a one-room log dirt floor cabin, and we're very grateful for what we have. I want to, just to get you into the feel of the ranch, I'm going to work you through every season of the year because every season brings its own special workload. And we're still a very traditional old family outfit. We still stack hay loose. We do some round bailing now because it's so hard to get a big enough hay crew to put it all stacked. But we still stack at least half of our hay loose and we feed with Percheron horses, which is just, if you've never seen those big horses at work, it would just tear your heart out because they are magnificent. But winter feeding, I, I told you that our forefathers knew right away that they had to put up hay. So we feed, get this, this is the truth, you guys, we feed six to seven months out of the year. Now, I'm from New Mexico, and I... <laughs> this was a real shock to this kid, I'll tell you, when I moved to North Park because I just couldn't imagine having to feed six, seven months out of the year. It's like being tied down to a dairy where you have to milk every day because here you had to feed. You have to feed every day. I want to tell you a little bit about these magnificent draft horses because they are awesome. You know, they start every morning no matter how cold it is. That's nice. You know, you get a diesel four-wheel drive tractor out there and it's 30, 40 below and they grunt and they groan and they don't want to start. These horses, they start every morning. You know, you wonder how you're going to get through the seasons and the first thing you know, the middle of March comes around, we start calving out heifers and and by the 1st of April, you're calving out cows, and it's still miserable weather as a general rule. You know, it's nothing for us to have, you know, 30 below during our calving. We live with these herds. I mean, we're with them 24-7. And um, if some of these nights when it's so cold, if you're not out there going around through them, and you can't pick up everything, but you pick up as much as you can, but you go through them and you pick up what you can, and if you don't have these calves picked up within 15, you know, 10, 15 minutes, they're dead on you. So um, it's a rough life. It's a hard life. But calving, you don't know how you're going to make it through, but you somehow do. And this is the kind of sight that awaits you and it just makes you smile. Then one day there's warmth, there's sunshine. Green grass. How can you explain the beauty of green grass? And you start getting excited because all your neighbors get together and you all brand together and you have a, a change and shift in the season. So I'm just going to show you a few pictures so you can get a feel of branding. And then irrigation and water management. You know, Kate was just talking about water and water management. We're so dependent on our snowpack so that we have runoff and irrigation water. And our forefathers went in with teams of horses and slips and fernos and built reservoirs to store water, built ditches to get it to the hay fields. Those hay fields were merely sagebrush areas before they started getting water put on them. And then when water got on the sagebrush, it killed out the sagebrush the native grass came through, and that's where we get our native grass hay that we have that is so famous in North Park. Most of you have probably heard of North Park hay. Isn't that a sight for New Mexico eyes, you guys? Look at that. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. Then we get into our summer season of packing salt and getting our cows out on green grass. And it's just, look at this green grass. It's just, oh, amazing. Summer grazing. Hang. 
This is a picture of Danny when he was nine years old. He remembers when there was not a single tractor on the place. Everything was done with horses. And he, here he is at nine years old out in the hay field with, uh, you know, they just took the, if Amir had a colt, the colt just went to the hay field and trailed along with his mother. And when he got hungry, he nursed. And that was just the way it was done. So at one time, all of our hang was done with horses like this portrays here. We consider ourselves modern today because we have uh, tractors and machinery, but most of you are chuckling at our modern day machinery. I can see the chuckles. But here's some hang pictures. And a lot of you probably are not familiar with stacking hay loose. These are actually two, turn, two ton trucks that have been turned around and made into what we call sweeps. They have teeth built into the front of them. They sweep down the wind rows. They buck the hay up into a pile like, like with this red sweep right here. He just came from a windrow with a bunch of hay, and he actually is going to go over in front of the beaver slide, dump it in front of the beaver slide. The pusher pushes it over the beaver slide into a wire cage, and that's what makes your hay stack is right there. And then we have a guy up there on the crow's nest with a hydrofork that presses the hay down into all of the cracks, puts a nice round top on it so that it sheds water. And we've torn into haystacks that are seven, eight years old, and they are as nice as the day they were put up and still have the same nutritional value that they had when they were put up. That's amazing. You couldn't do that with belled hay. But stacked hay is awesome, and feeding it with horses is really a great way to go. We get into fall. You know, trucks come in and take some of our calves out to a feedlot where we retain ownership on them. We have hay put in the corrals. We, uh, we wean our calves. We start feeding them three times a day at the hay rack with this loose hay. Our cows are, have wean calves on them. And here we are coming out of our high country, gathering our high country. This is our forest permit here, coming off of our forest permit. And look at the color. And this year, we really had beautiful color. I think when it's drier, we have prettier colors. Time to preg test the cows. You bring cows in, you get them preg tested, you process the calves. And in all of this, you've got to take some time once in a while to have some fun, to remind, remind yourself why you're doing what you're doing. Every year after we finish haying, we take our, our crew and we go on a day ride and go up into our high country and look at wild sheep. My husband is an avid wild sheep fan. And so that's something that we do just for the fun of it. You know, we have young people from CSU that do internships at the ranch and they enjoy being a part of things. We've had several young couples that have gotten married there at the ranch we use excuses, if you will, to have picnics and little get-togethers and, and ranch rodeos and parades and occasionally a nap. In all of this, we try to involve young people because we understand and realize that young people have to be coming along and, and are the next generation. So we do try to teach them. and help them to have a love for this way of life just as we have. You need good help. The four-legged kind and the two-legged kind. Cowboys and cowgirls. So now we're going to get to the real meat of my talk, transferring ranch ownership from one generation to the next. I've got some bullets that I'm just going to pop up here just so you get a feel for some of the statistics out there. But the average age of America's farmer and rancher is 58 years old. There is twice as many farmers and ranchers over the age of 65 as under the age of 65. Get this, half of agricultural land 
is owned by people older than 75. That's kind of scary, isn't it? 69% want to pass their farms or ranches on to their children, and yet, in the state of Colorado, only 3 to 5% of families have a complete estate plan. By splitting up and destroying viable farming and ranching operations, the death tax can erode the base of a rural community. The Farm Family Institute reports, I think this is very important, only one third of all family businesses succeed in the second generation, a mere 15% survive to the third, and only 5% make it into the fourth. And there's a reason for this. As inflation rises, land values go up, more land and livestock are needed to support a family. Research indicates that 42% of the first generation farm and ranch families have not discussed ranch succession with their spouses. 63% of that first generation have not discussed succession planning with their own children, the second generation. Only 16% have included a daughter or son in this conversation about succession. And yet, most older farmers and ranchers say that the farm is going to be their source of income. Succession planning is preparing the family farm or ranch for the inevitable transfer of ownership with the continuation of family leadership. Common goals for those wishing to retire, financial security upon retirement, providing for dependents, ensuring that the ranch stays in the family, and treating fam the kids equitably, equitably and fairly. And there is a difference, and we're going to talk about that some more as we go along here. So you probably wonder, you know, why, why do ranches fail? I was sitting with a group at noon today at the table and we were talking about this. Why, why do these family ranches, why are they failing? They're getting to be so few and far between. Well, there's reasons for that. One would be poor or no succession planning. They don't see the value in mentoring and bringing those next generation along. It, could, it might possibly not be large enough to financially bring on another family. You know, the soaring land prices that we have today has really been a bummer for agriculture because people can't buy. You know, when Ruth and Twist started out, and he was making $40 a month, and they saved their money, and they bought six heifer calves for $46 a piece, and they used that as a down payment on their first ranch. Think of it, folks. Young people today, you young people sitting out here in this audience, you don't even have that option, do you? It's unbelievable. Another reason ranches fail is too much debt or overhead. You know, overhead is what it costs to do business, whether it's utilities or insurance or, you know, um, maintenance, rent, all of those things. But when you carry too much debt or have too much overload, and then remember the dog picture, retaining and keeping good help because the dogs can't do it all. These seven Ds could wreck your family ranching operation. Disagreement, departures, depression, disability, divorce, debt, and death. Now, you know, <laughs> Ruth and Twist, they started gifting back in the 60s before it was really the in thing to do. And Ruth's brother, Ralph Jr., was a lawyer, so of course he insisted that the family have all their legal matters in hand, so we had 
partnership agreements written up. We had buy-sell agreements written up. We had all of the legal paper and work. And it was a good thing we did because the older brother decided that he, he and his wife decided that they wanted to move somewhere where they didn't have to feed seven months out of the year and where they didn't have elk in their haystacks every year. And so they decided to leave. Well, when times were good, we'd put together these agreements which said if somebody wanted to break up the partnership and get out, that they would have to take a 35%, 35% reduction in their value when they wanted out. Well, of course, that was a hard thing to swallow when it actually pushed, came to shove. That's a goodly amount, 35% but it was to protect the rest of the partnership from somebody wanting to break up the partnership. Do you see what I'm saying? And so, um, you know, departures do happen. Depression, you guys, could happen because of any one of these things. Any one of those things or accumulation of them could bring on depression. But divorce, let's look at divorce for a minute. You know, all of a sudden these uh, in-laws that their sons, excuse me, their sons have married and brought these women onto the ranch, and <laughs> and they're and and all of us women are not being gifted to. They're only be, the only the sons are being gifted to, but yet when a divorce occurs these in-laws who suddenly have become outlaws decide that they want a portion of the cake, right? And so all of this has to be looked at ahead of time and planned accordingly. You have to have all this legally set up and do it when times are good because I'll guarantee you when it's the heat of the argument, that's not the time to be discussing discounts and divorces. What are our choices if the kids don't want to come back to the ranch? After all, it could be our dream and not our kids' dream to come back to the ranch. Well, you could li liquidate the entire operation, but if you do, be aware of the tax consequences, folks, because they're going to be hefty. You know, you've got to really come up with some ingenious ideas if you want to do something like that, like a 1031 exchange or something like that to try to keep your assets together. You could lease out the surface rights and keep ownership of the land. A lot of people do that kind of thing. In some areas, you can stay as a business owner and, and hire a management team to run the operation. But I'll guarantee you that depends on where you live because you could not, in a hundred years, hire somebody to do that in North Park. No way. Stages in the average person's financial lifetime, we work to pay off debts. Our assets and land, livestock, and equipment grow. And you start in there trying to build a retirement portfolio but always in the back of your mind, it's making provisions for the future of that business. You know, and think about it, think about this too, you guys. We spend our entire lives working to pay off debt and to amass more, don't we? That's just the way we're built. You know, we want, we want more things, more land, more equipment, more cattle. So the stages for implementing a transition plan on a family farm and ranch, it's starting out with a dating period. And just like young people starting out, they, they uh, try to impress one another on that first date. You know, they brush their teeth. They try to, you know, be what will be impressive to that other person. So you go through that in any kind of a relationship. You go through a dating period. But then you start having to share duties. You know, bring that young person in, start sharing duties until they start eventually taking over more of the responsibilities of running that ranch to where that the senior partner can actually say, you know, I think you're ready. We're gonna turn this outfit over to your management 
and I'll be in the sidelines if you need me. You might ask why some families delay transfer. One of the biggest reasons is about the fear of losing one's own identity. You know, you think about it, these hardcore farmers and ranchers, ranchers out there is the only life most of them have ever known. All they know is work. And if they don't start getting some kind of um, hobby or outside life, they're never going to feel comfortable in leaving the ranch. And some of the things they might do, you know, they might want to take up, you know, get involved with their church, get involved in, in uh, their cattlemen's organization or some industry involvement of some kind. You know, the Quivera Foundation, that would be a great place for, for somebody like that. But they fear about loss of purpose upon retirement. And then the financial thing is always in the back of their mind. Will there be enough finances for us to live comfortably and for the kids to come along and live comfortably? A lot of them want to pay off the debt before handing the business over to their children. And that's a grand thing to think about, but, you know, sometimes it's impossible to do. I told you we'd come back to this being fair to all children. You know, if you have a child that remains on the ranch and works it every day and helps you stay on the ranch and take care of it, and you've got a, a son that went to medical school and maybe you even paid his way through medical school, and, and you've got a daughter that wants to become a lawyer and you've helped her through school and then helped him buy a house and you hear where I'm going with this thing, and yet you feel like to be fair and equitable that you need to leave this farm or ranch equally to all three kids. Is that really being fair, folks? I don't think so, because you've got to fix it to where that the one that is there on that ranch that didn't have a life outside of the ranch is going to be able to end up with that ranch now, you might have to do some brilliant thinking to come up with some ways to handle it to where you are being fair. But if you've paid for the others' college educations and their first home, that's a pretty good gift right there, wouldn't you say? So you, you've already done that much for them. A lot of times kids will buy a life insurance parent, uh, policy on the parents so that that will actually pay them so that the one on the ranch or farm can stay there and still make a viable living on it. So getting started with a succession plan, the farm specialist at Virginia Tech came up with a big list of things and I want to share them with you. We've talked about um, what it takes to get started and Number one, you've got to make your mind up to start planning. But I think this is crucial because bringing another person in takes an estimated $150 to $250 in gross revenue or $40 to $70,000 in net profit. So you can see where it is nip and tuck for some of these ranchers and farmers to bring kids on into the family because there just isn't that kind of extra income. But these specialists also came up with transitions are twice as likely to be successful and the business four times more profitable when the family member works for someone else for three to five years. I know that for a fact to be true. And then they also say that you need to move that successor into a management and decision making within six years. They say that farms that fail to do so are twice as likely to have an unsuccessful transition and are less profitable. Don't stay too long before turning the business over because they have found that the length of time for the average business owner is 30 to 35 years. And they also think that the most successful transition plans have the assets transferred to those managing the business. And, and then they came in with this uh, 
treating children equally and, and, and fairly. An operating agreement, and everybody should have one that's, uh, that's working as a family farm operation, should include time expectations, goals, responsibilities, and accountabilities. And he, they bring up, too, what I've already call, uh, shared with you. The transition plan should have a good buy-sell agreement in place to cover things, the, the Ds that we mentioned. And your list of advisors should include everything from your banker, if you have a loan, to your accountant and your lawyer. And you need annual meetings, but most of all, you need to communicate. Equally important is having a true value of your net worth statement with realistic market values of your assets and your liabilities. You need to begin by setting your goals. You know, talk to your spouse, talk to your husband, talk to your wife. Set goals because remember what I said, what I want isn't necessarily what the next generation is going to want. People like to procrastinate when it comes to succession and estate planning, but a plan often takes two to three years to complete. I know it did for us. And then you need to revisit that plan periodically. You know, you need to take into account new births, divorce, all those things that enter into the picture. The top 10 things families do to break up their ranching operations. Assume all genetic relationships equal good working relationships. Believing the business can financially support any and all members. Assuming everyone involved will be willing to make changes. Presuming a conversation is a contract. Or believing mind reading is an acceptable form of communication. Failing to build communication skills when times are good so they will be in place when times are tough. We've already talked about that. Ignoring the in-laws. You know, when someone feels excluded, when there is no, I, let's put it this way, when there's no inclusion going on, when you're not bringing them in and making them feel a part of things, their minds are going to start wondering and they're going to start feeling excluded, aren't they? So the lack of inclusion will automatically bring on exclusion in their minds. So you can't ignore them. Don't forget to use common courtesy. You know, common courtesy is getting to be almost a rare thing, it seems, in this age we're living in. You know, thank yous and, and considerations, you know, doing little things to help the, you know, the other people out. But don't forget those common courtesies. And then having no legal and discuss management plan or buy-sell agreement. And then, remember, we talked about celebrating. Four documents every adult should consider having, pre being, having prepared is a will. Now, a will is just what you want with what you have to where, where you want it to go. The trouble with just having just a will is that it doesn't avoid probate. You want to have a durable power of attorney and a durable power of, for health care issues. But that's only if you get to the point where you cannot take care of those things for yourself. You want to have somebody that you trust that will be able to step in and take care of those things for you. You should think seriously about a living will. The trouble with a short horse in Colorado, and you can see the trouble with not having a plan. I hope you can now. So then you ask, what is an estate plan? It's a plan for managing your wealth while you're alive and distributing it after your death. You can transfer ownership if you so choose. You don't have to. There's other ways to do it. Reduce estate taxes and avoid unnecessary transfer taxes. Right now, the federal tax exemption is 5.45 for per person or 10.90 for a couple. That sounds, that's almost $11 million. You know, you're thinking, wow, that's a lot of money. But you pick up any real estate guide and see what farms and ranches are selling for today. You know, that's just a little tip. 
but it's so much better than the 600,000 that we just had a few years ago that we're all grateful, aren't we, that it's been raised. But it still is not adequate, so you have to do some planning. You, excuse me, you need to secure the financial futures for the senior partners. They're the ones that have put this together, that have held it together, and they need to be taken care of. You need to do these management skills to bring on the next generation so that they'll be ready to take over the reins. And you want to leave a legacy. Now in doing that, I'm going to just say this to you folks. You don't have to feel obligated to leave an estate to your kids. You don't owe them an estate. What you do owe them is the mentoring to bring them along to be able to do it and then to leave it in a legal manner to where that they are able to step in and take over when you're not there and be a success. That's what you owe them. Some kids today feel entitlement, but that's not it. So. If you leave the ranch for your heirs to fight over and they end up selling it to settle matters, what kind of legacy is that? What kind of legacy is that? So we have a little bit of time for questions for Lucy. Oops, I better not yep. leave. I'm trying to flee. <laughs> <laughs> okay, some questions over here. Oh, Jeremy. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. That was a lot of great information and um, a lot of information that uh, may, may be a little bit far for someone like me who's um, not even, you know, can't even think about a marriage, let alone letting <laughs> something like getting to this kind of point. So I'm wondering what kind, of, um, what kind of information or what kind of suggestions you might have for someone who's a little younger and looking to get into this kind of field. What, what, um, what, what suggestions would you have um, going in to uh, operations like this? First of all, I want to share with you that there's a lot of people like Danny and I out here that don't have any children. I haven't said that, have I yet? We don't have any children. So we have nieces and nephews, and, and you know, hopefully some of them will come on and, and fill these shoes that I've been talking about, but there's no guarantees of that. And I think the main thing is, is that keep your eyes and ears open. I mean, there's other people like Danny and I out here who, who are looking for young people that aren't afraid to work, who want to be in this way of life, who are willing to go over and beyond. Let's face it, ranching is not an eight to five job. And, 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 less, and this might sound awful of me, but you know, I know what the generations before us did. The hard life and the hard work. And I know what Danny and I have done to preserve that and keep that legacy and those traditions alive. Is it wrong that I want somebody else to have to put some blood, sweat, and tears into the outfit? I just had a question. You didn't mention anything about conservation easements. Is that something that you... Well, I figured that you people get that on a daily basis here <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> from all of the literature out here on the tables and stuff. I, I will say a couple of things about conservation easements because Art this morning had made the comment and he said that it is a tool, but it's not the right thing for everyone. And I think everybody that has delved into them would say the same thing. It's not for everyone. It's a tool that's out there available. I think if your main interest is in restricting use and development on the land, then go for it. If you have reservations about, if you say, boy, I don't know what the next generation's needs are going to be, and I don't want to restrict them, then you've got to take that into consideration. 
you also have to take into consideration, are you willing, as a landowner that has put your blood, sweat, and tears into this outfit, are you willing to sell out to a land trust and have their name on your title forever and always? Because those are the things that each and every person that owns land is going to have to decide on those issues. Because it's right for some people and it isn't right for others. And it's a personal thing, I think. Okay, thank you, right. Lucy.